Okay lang ba? No. Good morning, church. Happy Easter Sunday. Um, shall we rise as we sing holy, holy, holy before we start our service today? So 1 Peter 1.3 Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So today, we are reminded and we give praise that He died for our sins once and for all, but it did not end there. He has risen and overcame death for us to have a restored relationship with the Father through Him. We had no hope as sinners. It was a dead end for all of us. But we have been shown mercy and grace, no matter, no matter what, despite of how undeserving we are. Our eternity has been sealed, as the song says, signed, sealed, delivered. And that is the greatest gift everyone should take to heart. That us sinners, so undeserving, was shown mercy and given new life in Him because of His great love. May this gift not just end with us. This gift should not only be remembered every holy week. It should be remembered on a daily basis. Because every day we still fail Him. We still miss the mark. We fail His standards as Christians. But every day we are given a new day to put on our armor and live out this salvation so that others may see the love He has in us. May we continue to... Pass on the knowledge of this gift of salvation to anyone and everyone we encounter, anywhere we are placed. Not just as a result of our thanksgiving to His sacrifice, but ultimately because we love Him and give everything back to Him.
Jesus not only died on the cross, but He overcame death. And that, that is something that we have to be happy for because now we have a living God. Now all the prophecies that was previously um, given to them has been fulfilled because of what He has done. And I pray that as we uh, remember Easter Sunday, we are also joyful because He rose again and that means that we are worshiping a true and living God. as we sing our last song.
Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Father, for this morning. We gather together, Father, to proclaim that our God lives and that our God reigns and that our God is coming again. We thank you, Father, because we have a living God, a God who's able to continue to make a difference in our lives, a God who's able to save us in our times of trouble. We thank you, Father, because you are the God who proves once and for all that death is not the end. And we thank you because in Christ, we always have hope. In Christ, we know that there's something to look forward to in life. Father, we thank you, Father, for this morning as we once again remember the death of and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because through it, our sins found forgiveness because through the death of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ we finally have power over sin we are able to say for the very first time no to ungodliness no to wickedness for the very first time we have the power to be the slave to righteousness and I thank you Father for that Father we thank you Father and this morning, as we come together to worship you, remind us that we are worshiping a living God. That our worship should not be based on the faith of dead people, O oh Lord. 
but that our faith should be living and active because we serve a living and an active God. Father, I commit each one of us into your hands, Father. I pray that this morning, once again, Father, our worship will be all about you, Lord. Help us to let down everything, Father, that would seek to hinder our worship of you. Father, whatever may hinder and object and, and um, deter us, Father, from worshiping you, our sins, our ambitions, our goals, our distractions, O oh Lord, I pray, Father, that we can all lay them down at your feet today. And I pray, Father, that this morning, our worship would flow directly from our hearts to bring glory and honor to your name. I pray, Father, that this morning, our worship will be acceptable and pleasing to you. Father, this morning, once again, we give you thanks for this opportunity. And we ask that as we come to your word this morning, your Holy Spirit would once again be powerful in this place. That your spirit would work through your words to transform our lives for your glory and honor. This is our prayer, Father, that you continue to speak to each one of us. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Last week, we start talking about Jesus healing the woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. Okay. We mentioned that this woman was in desperate need. She went through many different doctors and was never able to find healing. And in those 12 years, she used up what little money she had. And all, because, and all this didn't help her one bit. She went from bad to worse. And only when she came upon Jesus Christ did she find healing from the Lord. This morning we continue our, look, uh, our study on the Gospel of Luke. And we continue to look at the events that transpired uh, before and after the healing of this woman who was bleeding for 12 years. Allow me to read from the NIV version. It says, Now when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus went on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touch me. I know that power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had, in, she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed, her, has healed you. Go in peace. 
While Jesus was still speaking, someone from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, as someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe and she will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James. And the child's father and mother, meanwhile, all the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She is not dead but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents was, were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. The Bible starts by telling us that there was a man named Jairus. Okay, Who is this Jairus? Well, the first thing that the Bible tells us is that this Jairus was a synagogue ruler. For those of you who are not familiar what, with what a synagogue is, there's actually one here in Makati. Okay, There's actually one here in Makati. It's, a big, it's one of the biggest synagogues. A synagogue is not a temple. People go to the temple to offer sacrifices during the time of Jesus Christ. But synagogue started during the 400 year of silence. During the 400 years between the New Testament and the Old Testament, they didn't, hear, they didn't hear any words coming from God. There were no prophets who were sent by God. And during that period of time, remember, during the Babylonian Empire, the temple was destroyed. And because the temple was destroyed, they were not able to offer their sacrifices to the Lord. And so what happened during that period of time? There were Pharisees who came into being. The sect Pharisees came into being together with the Sadducees and all other sects like the Essens. The Pharisees, they're very focused on the word of the Lord, the Old Testament, especially the law of the Lord. And so the Pharisees, they started what they call the synagogue. Okay, In the synagogue, it is there that they taught the word of the Lord. So when you go to a synagogue, you go there to listen to the word of God, to listen to it being explained okay, on what the law literally means. And that's why a synagogue is very important during those times, more, probably more important than the temple because at the time, they actually go to the synagogue more times in a week than they go to the temple. Because when you go to the temple for the common Israelites, they are not even allowed to go into the Holy of Holies or the Holy Place. They can only go up until the courtyard to offer their sacrifices. They're not actually able to get in to the temple itself. So for them, the synagogue was much more important because they get to hear the word of God in the synagogue. So if you ever had a chance to visit a synagogue, uh, for those of you who went to Israel, you know this. We, we went to a synagogue, and you know that there are um, it's, a, it's a place like this, but there's a room behind the synagogue. And the, the room behind the synagogue is where they put all these giant scrolls. Okay, as I said, a synagogue is where you preach the word of God. And Jairus, being the synagogue ruler, he was the leader of that particular synagogue. Meaning to say he was the one in charge of everything that transpires in that synagogue. He's the one making sure that all the scrolls are kept properly for the daily use. And that's basically the work of a synagogue ruler. In Israel, there were many synagogues. Even in one particular place, they could have more than one synagogue. And Jairus happened to be one of the rulers of one synagogue. The second thing we learned about Jairus is being the synagogue leader. Remember, as I mentioned a while ago, a synagogue is where you preach the word of God. The synagogue ruler are not the ones who are preaching the word of God. It is usually the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And because you are the synagogue ruler, you are dependent on the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And they had very close relations with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Now, you can just imagine for someone who's a synagogue ruler, he, 
he, he is biased towards the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And we know for a fact that at this point in Jesus' life, he was treated as an enemy of the Pharisees. He was treated as an enemy of the teachers of the law. They were jealous of him. And for Jairus to be a synagogue ruler, he would have to have sided with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And in short, he would be considered one of the enemies of Jesus Christ at this point. And that's why this story is all the more interesting because if we look at the Bible, we find Jairus pleading before Jesus. We find Jairus pleading before Jesus. Look at what the Bible says. This synagogue ruler actually fell at Jesus' feet. It, it was an act of humility. It was an act of humility. But more than an act of humility, he was actually pleading. Let me ask you a question. When do enemies plead with you? When do your enemies plead with you? Do your enemies plead? <laughs> Di ba, may, mga, may mga kaaway tayo na sasabihin, kahit na mamu, ma, magunaw na yung mundo, I will never come to you for help. Okay. So when do enemies actually come pleading? Okay. What makes a self-made man do this? Usually, it's when someone who is desperate, someone who is hopeless, someone who is broken. When he understood that there is a limit to what he can do, and he can do no more, and he needs someone's help, a particular person's help. It is during this time that we go pleading with the person who can help us, be that our enemy or not. For this Pharisee, he understood at this point. Bakit? Ano ba nangyayari? The Bible tells us that he was the father of a dying 12-year-old. Not only that, because the Gospel of Luke told us that this was his only daughter. Probably daddy's girl to. Probably this girl was very precious to him. More precious than other daughters. And so when this girl was dying it feels like his world was actually crumbling down on him. It feels like the world was caving in on him. My only daughter is about to die. My hope, my, my joy, my, the apple of my eye is about to be taken away from me. It drove him to hopelessness. It drove him to desperation that he would come to Jesus Christ for help. And that's what the, and this is one thing I want us to understand. When our world caves in on us, the Lord is easily approachable. The world when the world caves in on us, remember that our Lord is easily approachable. Nakakalungkot no because when you look at faith healers, if you have the chance to to go to a faith, a, a faith healing session, makikita mo, usually yung faith healer who would be coming from abroad, he would have a lot of bodyguards. Ikaw may sakit ka, you want to go up the stage to be healed, the bodyguards would stop you. They are not approachable. They are not approachable, but look at the Bible. Every time people come to Jesus for healing, Jesus would never turn them away. Jesus would never turn them away. That's the main difference between Jesus and many of our fake healers. Hindi niya tina turn away. Okay? But what, why do I say that Jesus is easy, easily approachable? Look at this. Then a, man, then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house. To come to his house. Lord, punta ka sa bahay ko. Bakit? Kasi yung anak ko mamamatay na. Now, let me, let me point this out very, inter very interesting fact. There are only three persons that Jesus healed in their own homes. There were only three people that Jesus healed in their own homes. Sino-sino mga yun? Any idea? 
Who did Jesus heal in, her ho in their homes? Hindi ko marinig? Yes. Unang-una, mother-in-law of Peter. Diba? He, she had very high fever and Jesus healed her. Now, the interesting thing there is, Peter never invited Jesus to go to his house to heal his mother-in-law. In fact, this was the first healing that Jesus ever did. Being the first healing, Peter probably never knew that Jesus could actually heal anyone at that point. He actually invited Jesus to his home to have dinner with him. And it so happened that the mother-in-law of Jesus was sick that Jesus decided to heal Peter's mother-in-law. It was not that Peter invited him to go to his house to heal the mother-in-law. Peripheral lang na nakita niya, may sakit yung mother-in-law that Jesus healed him. Healed her. Sino yung pangalawa? We tackled that a few weeks ago. Wala? Walang malala? It was the centurion's servant. Jesus healed the centurion's servant at his home. But the interesting thing is Jesus didn't go into his home. Jesus was afar and he said, um, and the centurion sent someone to Jesus and told Jesus, Lord, the centurion said, You'd, we are not worthy to receive you at my home. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus from afar just simply said, be healed. And the servant was healed at the home. Jesus didn't go to his home. And yet, Jairus was very interested because he was the only one who didn't bother to bring his daughter to Jesus. Remember, we have a lot of cases in the Bible where friends would bring their friend to Jesus for healing, when relatives would bring their relatives to Jesus for healing. This was the first time that they were asking Jesus to go to his home to heal his daughter. And Jesus complied. Jesus actually complied with the request of his enemy, Jairus. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 tells us, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Let me tell you, there are people I can easily approach with. But there are some people na kahit ka-close ko, hindi ko siya malapitan. Bakit? Bakit? Because there are some people who are approachable and some people just simply who are not approachable. And when someone is approachable, guess what? May confidence ka. You're not afraid to come to him because you know that this person will allow you to come to him. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is an approachable God. And the Bible tells us that every time we come to God, we find a God who's approachable, who's ready to receive us. And that's why the Bible tells us, come to Him with confidence. Look at what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. It is Jesus inviting us. Come to me, all you who are weary and, heavy and burdened, and I will give you rest. He's inviting us to come to Him. That's how approachable our God is. So when our world is caving in on us, the first thing we need to understand is that our God is a God who's easily approachable. And that is never more clear than in the story of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son, the focus is not on the son. The focus is on the father. The focus was on the father. The father, ano ginagawa ng father? The Bible says that he was waiting for the son to come home. He was waiting for the son while he was still afar. Nakita niya. And the Bible says it was the father who ran to the son. Ang ganda ng, I don't know if you, if you remember this beautiful, beautiful song from the 1990s. It's entitled, When God Run. Ang ganda ng lyrics. It was the only time I ever saw God run was when he ran to me, took me in his arms, held my hand to his chest, and said, my sons, come home again. Lifted my head, wiped the tears from my eyes, 
with forgiveness in his voice, he said, My son, do you know I still love you? Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a beautiful reminder that our God is a welcoming God? No matter how sinful we are, the Bible says if we just confess our sins, He will forgive us all our unrighteousness. Our God is a welcoming God. That's the full story of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. He came to be a human being because we cannot find a way to God. He became the way for us. That's what Christmas is all about. That's what the resurrection is all about. That Jesus Christ came to seek and save those who are lost. Because He's an approachable God. Pag hindi tayo lumalapit siya, yung lalapit sa atin siya, maghanap sa atin. But here's the problem. Some of us, we don't want to approach God. John chapter 3, verse 19 to 20 tells us, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light. Because, ito yung reason, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light. There's a welcoming God ready to receive any of us who come to Him in, for, in repentance. But the problem is, tayo yung hindi, ayaw lumapit. Tayo yung ayaw lumapit. What hinders us from going to Him? Sin. When we love our sin, when we love our sin, the last thing we want is to come before God. Because God is a holy God. And when we stand before God, na magnify yung kasalanan natin. Diba? That's why you go through the Bible, you find that every time someone thought that they saw God, the first reaction is not happiness. And the first reaction is not rejoicing. The first reaction was always of fear. In the Old Testament, King James Version, the word is they were terrified. There was a great terror whenever they thought they saw God. Unang reaction nila, lagot ako. Patay na ako because I have seen the Holy God, the, con- the all-consuming fire. You see, sin will keep us away from God. You, con- you continue to play around with sin, you will not want to come before God. If you're having problems with your spiritual life right now, with your devotions, with your prayers, maybe there's a sin lingering around. And that's why you don't find it comfortable to come before God. But the second reason why we don't want to come to to God is shame. And shame and guilt are very much similar. Nahiya tayo sa kasalanan natin. Nahiya tayo dahil madumi tayo. Yesterday, I was watching um, Rafi Tulfo in action. And there was this girl who was raped. Okay, he was complaining to Rafi Tulfo. She was raped by this particular man. And Rafi Tulfo was asking him, after being raped and you were let go, where, what was the first pl- thing you do? Where did you go after being raped? She, she said, I went to 7-Eleven. And I stayed there for hours. And Rafi Tulfo was asking her, Bakit ayaw mo umuwi? I was filled with shame. Binabuy ako. I feel like babuy ako. And I could not face my parents. Shame has a tendency to do that. When you're living in shame, you don't want to come before God. Lalo na yung guilt. Remember Adam and Eve, when they sinned against God, the first thing they did is hid from God. The Bible tells us that they were walking with God. They were enjoying fellowship with God. But the very first time they sinned, they hid from God. And of course, when you have a faulty understanding of who God is, When we were growing up, we were taught wrongly that this God is a God who is very strict. He's like a policeman na nakaabang palagi sa pagkakamali mo. Yung mga ninja cups natin. Nakatago. Biglang susulpot pag nagkamali ka na. And many people believe that this is the kind of picture that best represents our God. And that's why many are afraid to come to God. Diba? How many times have we heard people saying, ayoko pumunta sa church kasi baka masunog ako doon. And brothers and sisters, it's a very sad reality. 
Because that's not the picture that Jesus shows us who He is. Go through the Bible and we find Jesus always approachable by the people who needs Him the most. What drives us to Him? Desperation. The prodigal son, he was desperate. He was hungry. He had nowhere to go. And that's the only time he thought, better siguro umuwi na ako ng bahay. The sad fact is many Christians wait until the point of desperation before they come back to God. But let me tell you, desperation is the best motivation to pull us back to God. But I hope we don't have to get to that point. Sometimes God pushes us towards desperation. Remember when Jonah disobeyed God? He was running away from God. And God had to bring him to the point of desperation. For three days and three nights, he was in the belly of a fish. And if you take the time to read Jonah chapter 2 and read through the prayers of Jonah, you understand the desperation that he was in. He was a desolate man at that point. And it was then that he remembered the Lord. The very last verse of chapter 2, he says, What I have made vowed to God, I will make good. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And those who, for, who, 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 those who worship idols forfeits the grace that could be theirs. Jonah finally realized God was using this point of desperation to bring you back to Him. Kanina, I was listening to Charles Swindoll over the podcast. And Charles Winslow said something very beautiful. Sabi niya, there was a worship service that they asked this elder to pray for them. And this elder prayed a very beautiful prayer. And the prayer goes something like this. Lord, keep, uh, help us to always remember what we were before we met you. Never let us forget what we used to be before you came into our lives. Help us remember that point of desperation where we came to know Jesus Christ and never let us forget it. My sisters, we have a God who is easily approachable. But not only is He easily approachable, He is also ever available. We have a God who is always ever available. Nakakatawa, no? Kasi this Pharisee, itong, itong synagogue ruler who was supposed to be an enemy of Jesus Christ, very demanding. Very demanding. Lord, can you come to my house? My daughter is about to die. You have to come and heal her quickly. Magmanali tayo, mamamatay na yung anak ko. <coughs> you know what the Bible says? Jesus got up and went with him and so did his disciples. He never negotiated. He never asked how far your house is. He never asked where do you live. He just got up and went with him. And if you go through the Bible, you understand so many cases, we find Jesus always available. Diba? Nagmamalali si Jesus dito. He was on his way to the, pari, to the synagogue ruler's house. And then what happened? This bleeding lady decided to touch Jesus. Nagmamadali si Jesus. And then he stopped. Why did Jesus stop? Last week, we, we talked about this. Last, last week, we talked about this. We said the reason Jesus stopped is because although this woman received healing, she never received the, she never received the certificate of cleanliness or being clean. Okay? And because she is still considered unclean by the people around her, no one would still want to be associated with her. Jesus stopped even though she, he knew very well who touched him. Even though he knew very well that this woman was already healed. Jesus stopped in order to recognize that this woman was healed and to let everyone know this woman is okay now. You can now relate with her once more. She's been healed. She is already clean. Nakakatawa because if you're Jairus probably at this point, you'd be very nervous. Lord, mamamatay na yung anak ko. Ano ba? 12 years na nagdudusa yan. What's another hour? Let her wait for one hour. Let's go. Pabayaan mo muna natin yan. Mas importante to. This is more urgent. 
But you see, Jesus was always available to those who need Him. He stopped. He stopped to take care of the need of this bleeding woman. There's a very interesting point to this, no? This woman had been in bleeding for 12 years. And this young lady who was about to die was 12 years old. And by the way, today, hindi ka pwede kasal until sa Philippines is 18 years old, right? Or 21. Without ma- parents' consent. I think it's 18. Okay? You need to be 18 before you can get married without any parents' consent. But in Israelites' time, they can actually get married at the age of 12. 12 was the marrying age. And that's why during that time, we believe that Mary was still in her teens when she had Jesus. But this woman, this daughter of Jairus, was 12 years old when she died. She was supposed to be marriageable age. Look at this. 12 years ago, there was great joy in the house of Jairus. But 12 years ago, there was great sadness in the life of this woman. The last 12 years brought about great hope for the house of Jairus. Yung anak ko, ikakasal, magkakaroon ng descendants, will carry on the family name. And yet, for the last 12 years, this woman has been inching closer to death. And so Jesus decided to stop, to be available for this woman. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you this. Times of desperation reveals who our true friends are. Times of desperation reveals who our true friends are. It's not during times when everything's going well. It's not during times when everything is successful and fun. It is during times of desperation. Bakit? Because when times of desperation comes, when times of crisis comes, hindi mo kayang ilagay sa schedule mo yan. You cannot predict when these times of problems will come. And doon mo makikita, who are your friends who will actually get rid of their schedule just to be with you in your times of desperation? And that's why someone who's approachable but not ready to receive you, not available, walang kwenta rin. It's one thing to be approachable, but it's altogether another thing to be available. You may be approachable, but if you're not available, wala rin kwenta. Wala rin kwenta. And yet, our God is both approachable and available. Look at what the Bible says. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will never slumber nor sleep. This is a God who will not sleep on you. You know, minsan, pag nag, minsan even as a pastor, no? as a pastor, there was a situation when I was in Makati Hope. Eh, I think nakwento ko to sa inyo last time. Back when we were in Makati Hope, in the middle of the night, someone texted me, Pastor, yung kapatid ko may hawak na itak, hinahabol yung mama ko. In the middle of the night, I was already ready to sleep. I had to go out of my way, go to Malate, invite ko yung kapatid, go out to have ice cream, just to calm him down. Ako lang, ayoko. <laughs> Kung ako lang, hindi ko gagawin yun. Diba? Si Vixon, uh, alam mo si Vixon, we're, we're, pretty cl- we're pretty close. If Vixon should call me up in the middle of the night, Pastor, nandito ako sa Baguio, stranded. Can you please come and pick me up? <laughs> Bahala ka sa buhay mo. <laughs> diba? Bakit? You see, times of desperation will prove who your friends are. The Bible tells us that we have a God who's ready to help. All the time. Look at what the Bible says in Psalm 46. God is our refuge and and strength and ever-present. Ever-present. He's never absent when you need help. When you're in trouble, He's never absent. 
And that's why nakakalungkot yung song that we sing. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. All because we do not carry everything to the Lord in prayer. The Bible tells us that God is just a prayer away. The problem is when we don't pray, we forfeit the grace that could be ours. Our God is approachable, our God is available, but if we don't come to Him, we forfeit the grace that could be ours. Are we taking advantage of this God who's willing to be open, who is always available and always ready to help us? Look at what the Bible continues to tell us. In Luke chapter 8, while Jesus was still speaking, someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Patay na. Huwag mo nang guluhin yung master. Don't bother him anymore. Wala na siyang magagawa. Hearing, Jesus, hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, Don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. Look at this. The Lord is not just simply, is not simply easily approachable. He is not simply ever available, but He is also extremely able. He is extremely able. Look at what the Bible tells us. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, all the people were already wailing and mourning. They were already crying. Why were they crying? Because the Bible says they were already, they believe that she's already dead. Okay? They know that she's already dead. Nakakatuwa, no? Kasi in Matthew chapter 9, verse 23, it gives us a little more information. The Bible tells us, they saw, uh, when they got to the ruler's house, they saw the flute players. In Israel, they don't, they don't have funeral homes like we do. Tayo, umaabot ng one week. Lamay. In Israel, they don't do that because you become unclean with a dead person. So what they do on the spot, that day, they will have to bury the dead person. That's also true in Muslim cultures. Okay? On that day, ililibing. Kung namatay siya that day, that day siya ililibing. And that's why, etong babae, pagkamatay na pagkamatay, kumuha na kagad sila ng magtutugtog. Flute players, they knew she was dead. Luke chapter 8, verse 53 says, they laughed at him knowing that she was dead. Sabi niya, stop wailing. The daughter is not yet dead. She's just sleeping. And they were laughing at him. It was not a laughter of funny laughter. It was a laughter that mocks you. It's a laughter that makes you feel derogated. They were, making, they were not simply making fun with him. They were actually looking down on him. Bakit? Because they know that she was dead. The word no is very interesting. It comes from the Greek word gino. Okay, ginao or ginao. Ginao is a very beautiful word because it talks about intimate understanding of someone. And in the Old Testament, when they, interpret, when they translated the Old Testament into the Septuagint Greek translation of the Bible, remember yung Old Testament natin is in Hebrew. Someone translated it into the Greek language which we call the Septuagint. Okay, Septuagint is in the Greek. The Old Testament is in Greek. It's very interesting because when it says, Adam knew Eve and they begot. It's the word ginao. He knew Eve intimately. And then they had a child. It's that word, ginao. Okay? Knew intimately. And basically they're saying, we know very well, we know for a fact, without doubt, that this girl is dead. You're making a fool of yourself when you say that this girl is only sleeping. Bakit? Because there's a way we can tell. It's not a belief, it's knowing, it's a knowledge. Alam mo kung patay yung tao. Pag may namatay sa harap mo, you don't say, I believe he's dead. You say, I know he is dead. Why? Because medically, we can actually be certain. Diba? May pulse ba? May breath ba? We know whether someone is dead or alive. And they're saying, we already know. 
may medical evidences that this person was still, was already dead. And so they were laughing at Jesus. You see, there is a feeling of finality whenever we deal with death. There is always a feeling of finality whenever we deal with, we deal with death. Kaya sabi nila, wag mo na guluhin si Master. Don't bother the Master anymore. Your daughter is already dead. There's nothing he can do anymore. Now that's very interesting because there's only three people in the Bible that Jesus raised from the dead. Sino ang tatlong yun? Lazarus is the most popular one. Sino pa? We'll talk about that later. Okay, we'll talk about that later. But what I want to point out here is that sabi ni Benjamin Franklin, in this world there is nothing certain but death and taxes. Sure doubt. So one author said, um, the only thing that we can be 100% sure is death because no one's ever come out of it alive. <laughs> okay. Lahat ng pinanak na matay, walang makaka... Actually, that's not right. No? Kasi if we go to the Bible, we understand that there were two people who didn't die. Sino yun? Si Enoch, tsaka si Elijah. Okay? Two people didn't die in the Bible. But the Bible is, uh, Benjamin Franklin is telling us, there's only two things that's sure. Death and taxes. Pag may, pag may namatay, sure ka. Okay? It's a something, it's, it's a certainty that people die. Okay? It's a certainty. But look at this. Jesus took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. And look at what happened. Her spirit returned and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he ordered them not to tell anyone what had happened. Now look at this. John chapter 11, verse 25 to 26, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Ito yung story ni Lazarus. Okay, and Jesus there told Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and the, and the life. He who believes in me will, uh, will, will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, it's very interesting because Jesus never said, I can resurrect you. I can make you alive again. Rather, he said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. I'm the source by which people can be resurrected. I'm the source of life for people as well. I'm not just able to. I'm more than able to. Because I am the resurrection. And I am the life. Why is it important that Jesus had to resurrect from the dead? Why did Jesus have to rise from the dead? We've talked about that every year. Every, every Resurrection Sunday, we talk about why Jesus had to rise from the dead. Okay, especially when we go through 1 Corinthians chapter 15, hinimay-himay natin lahat yan. All the reasons why Jesus has to rise from the dead. But there's another reason why Jesus has to rise from the dead. There's another reason why Jesus has to rise from the dead that we never talk about. Ano yun? Look at this. There are only three people that Jesus rose from the dead. The boy at Nain, we've talked about that in Luke chapter 6. Jairus' daughter and Lazarus. All three occasions, Jesus raised someone from the dead. Now, when Jesus raised someone from the dead, you could always say, ah, yeah, kaya ni Jesus yan. Jesus can always raise someone from the dead. But here's the problem. You may believe Jesus is able to raise someone from the dead, but what if Jesus died? Can Jesus still raise people from the dead if he is dead? We don't know. We don't have any clue unless Jesus rise again. We know Jesus can raise people from the dead if he's alive. But what if he remained dead? Can he still raise people from the dead? And that's why one of the most beautiful picture of the resurrection it, is that it reminds us that Jesus is alive. It's one thing to know that Jesus could heal people, but what if Jesus is dead? Can he still heal us? 
But the beautiful thing is that Jesus didn't remain dead. He rose again. And because He's alive, He's able to continue to do what He has been doing in the past. And we need not be afraid. Jesus is alive. And that makes a world of difference in our faith. Because a dead person cannot help us anyway in our life today. What's the point if you have an available person, an, an, able, uh, uh, an able person, uh, a person who is approachable, but is dead? Diba? For all those to matter, you have to have a living person to be able to make a difference in our lives. But the second thing I want us to understand is the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, shows us the defeat of death. Death was finally defeated. Before Jesus Christ, death was this dark cloud that hangs over everyone. But look at what the Bible tells us. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55, it says, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is death, and the power of sin is the law. Now, when, Pete, when the Apostle Paul said these words, he's not just asking a, a rhetorical question. You know what he's doing? He's taunting death. He's taunting death. Kinakansyawan niya yung kamatayan. Bakit? The only people who can taunt death are people who are not afraid of death anymore. Why? Because Jesus has defeated death. And that's why we celebrate the Resurrection Sunday. Because we have a God who came out of the tomb. We have a God who stayed alive forevermore. Lazarus died again. The boy at Nain died again. Jairus' daughter died again. We don't know whether they actually believe in Jesus Christ. If they had believed in Jesus Christ, one day they will rise again. But if they did not, they will remain dead. And they will be eternally separated with God in eternity. 1 Corinthians chapter 50, 15, verse 55 to 56 goes on to tell us, But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why the Resurrection Sunday is very special to Christians. More special than Christmas, more special than any other celebration we have in Christian history. That's why if you go to other religions, Iglesia ni Cristo, they don't celebrate Christmas, but they celebrate Easter. Jehovah's Witness, they don't celebrate Christmas, they celebrate Easter. Why? Because they too understood the importance of the resurrection. Even though they don't have a right understanding of Jesus Christ, they understood the importance of His resurrection. And as Christians, we need to appreciate Easter more than any other celebration. Nakakalungkot na because Christmas, we always make a big deal about Christmas. But seldom do we really take time to appreciate the value of Resurrection Sunday. The bleeding woman, ano nangyari sa kanya? Jesus stopped death. She was inching toward death, getting worse and worse, and Jesus was able to put a stop to that. Jairus' daughter, Jesus was able to reverse the effects of death. That's how powerful our God is. The one thing that we are most fearful of, that no one comes out alive, He came out alive. And because of that, Jesus, when He died on the cross and rose again from the dead, He gave us a third reason that we need to look forward to every Easter Sunday, every Resurrection Sunday. It gives us hope. It gives us hope. Every Resurrection Sunday, we go through 1 Corinthians 15. Kanina nabasa natin verse 56 and 57. But seldom do we go through verse 58. Look at verse 58. Kanina, ano sabi sa 56, 57? Where, O death, is your sting? Where, O death, is your victory? Then he goes on to say that 
we have this victory in Christ Jesus. Okay? But he didn't end there. Look at verse 58. Ito yung conclusion niya. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is never in vain. The reason we need to love God and serve God more faithfully is because we have hope. We know that this world is not the end. That death is not final. That there are rewards to look for after life. People who don't serve the Lord as passionately, people who don't serve the Lord as faithfully, never understood the hope of the resurrection. Tingnan mo, kailan nagbago yung mentality ng apostles? When did the apostles change? They were afraid when Jesus died. When Jesus was arrested, they were all running away. Not one of them stood by Jesus' side to support Him. They were all running away. But it was when they fully understood that Jesus has rose from the dead, And they received the power of the Holy Spirit that they were willing to go through death. Bakit? Because now, they had hope. When Jesus was here on earth, they never understood the mission of Jesus Christ. When Jesus was here on earth, the apostles thought Jesus was here to establish His physical kingdom. And they were only thinking about this life. Na pag malapit ako kay Jesus, I'm going to keep close to Jesus because... One day when he becomes king, I will have a good position in his kingdom. Yun yung pinag nila. Lord, pag king ka na, who will get to sit on your left and right side? They were fighting over that. Bakit? They don't have a concept of eternity. And that's why when Jesus was arrested, their hopes were dashed. Wala na yung pinapangarap ko. No, wala. My sisters, people who understood the resurrection gives their life to the Lord. Serve the Lord faithfully. Ano sabi niya? Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Ano si- bakit niya sinasabi to? Because the Corinthian church, there were a lot of problems in their church. We're going through 2 Corinthians. We just went through 1 Corinthians in our Bible study. You know this. There were a lot of problems within the church. And if you're standing your ground, kawawa ka. And Paul was telling them, continue to stand firm. Bakit? Because your labor in the Lord is never in vain. In this life, you may not gain from it. In this life, you may lose business. You may lose people. You may lose friends. But guess what? Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Because there's something beyond this life to look forward to. Brothers when the world is caving in on us, and it is, these last few weeks, I don't know if you're following the news. Last night, three tourists died in Israel. Ang gulo ngayon sa Israel. There was great chaos in Israel. And there were a lot of missiles being moved back and forth between Israel and, and the Palestinian community. Ang daming riot sa France. Nagkakagulo sa Ukraine and, and um, Russia. And of course, what's going on with the BRIC today? Brazil, Russia, India, China. And pag natuloy itong BRICS na to, dollar will lose its value in the long run. And it's going to create a lot of chaos. It's going to create a lot of issues worldwide. We cannot even begin to predict what will happen in the next 5 to 10 years. And all this is because of sin. Bakit nag-aaway-aaway? Bakit yung China gusto kalabanin yung America at America kailan kalabanin yung USA, eh, yung China? All because of sin. People will always tell you, there's hope, there's hope, bakit? Magaling yung, politi- dapat mag- magaling yung politician. That's why people were fighting over who, 
who to vote last year. Pinag-aawayan, grabe yung away last year. Bakit? Because they're pinning their hopes on politics. They're pinning their hopes on an economist. They're pinning their hopes on the technologies that we have here on earth today. On social justice. In America, lalo na. People are willing to die for their social justice agenda. Environmentalist. And they'll say, human genius and creativity will pull us through, as it always has. And they forget that it's human genius and creativity that brought about atomic bombs and nuclear bombs and all these deadly weapons. My sisters, it's not a problem of genius. It's not a problem of politics. It all goes back to sin. And we begin to understand that with sin, there's human limitation. We don't know how to deal with sin. That's why we need a Savior. We need someone who's able to finally put an end to sin. Someone who is approachable, someone who's available, and someone who's able to do something about our situation today. And that's the beauty of the Resurrection Sunday. Because all three of them is useless unless this God is a living God. And aren't you glad that we as Christians are the only people of faith whose God is alive? And I pray and hope that this day, this Resurrection Sunday, we would once again reflect on what Jesus did on the cross for us. But more importantly, what His resurrection meant for us. Because the resurrection of Jesus Christ brought about so many things for us. He brought about atonement. He brought about forgiveness. He brought about reconciliation. He brought about redemption. He brought about adoption. He brought about um, propitiation. You know what else Jesus did when he went to the cross for us? The Bible says, Jesus said, unless I go, I cannot send the Holy Spirit to you. One of the greatest blessings we have when Jesus went to the cross and went up to heaven is that we have the Holy Spirit who now lives in us. The seal, the guarantee that we belong to Jesus Christ. That no one can take us out of his hands and yan yung hope natin. Yan yung guarantor natin. And I hope and pray that this day, may isang vacation day pa tayo tomorrow. Tomorrow's holiday. But I hope and pray that we take this time to really just reflect upon the resurrection day and what it means for us as Christians. Why don't we come to the Lord in prayer? Father, once again, we ask you to remind us of what this day really means for all of us within the Christian dome. Father, forgive us if a lot of times we choose to celebrate other events and forget about the resurrection. Father, forgive us if a lot of times when we think about the Holy Week, all we think about is vacation. And even in our vacation, Father, a lot of times you are not part of it. Forgive us, Lord. And I pray, Father, that indeed you'd quiet our hearts down. You'd still our minds, Lord. And help us to go back to 2,000 years ago. And look back to the cross. Look into that empty tomb. And find hope. Find grace. Find life. And I pray, Father, that as we understand this, we will never fear. And just as the psalmist says, though the stars be removed from the skies, though the world may give way, yet I will not be afraid. 
because I have put my faith in God. Father, we thank you because we have been reminded today that more than anything else, our God is a living God. And we thank you, Father, for that. Father, we thank you. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We'll be having our offering this morning. May we request um, Vixon and um, Rhea to help us with our offering today. May we request uh, Mrs. King to give a prayer of thanksgiving for our offering. Shall we rise? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much. You have given so much, Lord God. You have given your son. Thank you for his life. Thank you for the risen Lord that we have. We have eternal life. This is the best blessing that we have received. And we pray, Lord, that all of us people will realize this blessing what you have done at the cross we pray lord that many will come to repentance many will come to you and surrender their lives to you so that they will also receive this blessing lord god we thank you also for allowing us to receive blessings through the work of our hands. Thank you that you are the one who is giving us this opportunity to be able to give back to you. Receive this, Lord, with thanksgiving, Lord, we give this back to you. Thank you for uh, this time, Lord God, that you are going to help our leaders, Lord God, that this um, offerings will be used for your glory and honor, for the work of the mission of sharing your words to others. We just pray that you will empower our leaders so that these blessings will be used for your glory and honor alone. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Some announcement. Now we'd like to welcome, officially, well, uh, we'd like to welcome um, Benson and Lovely. Okay. We'd also like to welcome yung. Ah, uh, wala na, no? wala, wala na pala. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, just a reminder. Now we have our Bible reading program. Uh, we're gonna start our Bible reading program. Supposedly we're gonna start on April, but because and daming mawawala nung. Holy Week, we decided to move it to uh, May. No? We'll start at May uh, so that those who are not around will not be discouraged in reading the Bible. Uh, their Bible reading program goes something like this. No? I'll be sending you chapters to read per day and you're supposed to read it with someone else, not on your own. You can do that online. You can do that face-to-face. -face, but after reading the Bible passages that we've given you, uh, take a selfie 
with your with the person you're reading with and send it to our group chat okay and this is to encourage one another we'll be starting a new group chat for this purpose so that if you have questions in your reading you can post it there we can interact with the bible reading so that we can answer all the questions and interact with um with passages that are hard to understand as well okay uh, it's up to you there's no pressure you want to read once every week puede puede come every day um, we'll be giving the passage by the week no? so we'll give it by the week every first day of the week we will distribute the, the bible reading so you get to decide kung hindi mo natapos okay lang no pressure okay gusto mo habulin ayaw mo habulin okay lang you can proceed to the next week if you want no pressure the purpose of this is to encourage everyone to read the Bible. Okay, and I hope by doing so, we can finish the whole Bible cover to cover um, in one year or one and a half year. Yun yung target natin. Okay? Why don't we all rise as we come to the Lord in prayer? Father, we thank you, Father, for your grace. We thank you, Father, for your love. We thank you for Jesus Christ, the greatest gift of all. Through his sacrifice at Calvary, we have life. We receive grace and we are channels of grace. Father, I pray that as people of grace, we can indeed be people of grace. It is my prayer, Father, as we end our worship this morning, that wherever we go, we can continue to be our channels of peace and grace to this dying world. That this world may also come to know of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, that indeed wherever we go, we can continue to be your light that beacons these people back to, your, to you, O oh Lord. Once again, we give you thanks. We give you all the glory. And this is our prayer. In the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our worship service ends here. Go in peace. Uh, enjoy the fellowship at the back. God bless.